Good morning, friends. Thank you, Dr. Meena, for having me uh, here for your uh, course. Uh, it is my presentation is going to be a video-based one. During cataract surgery or while managing complications, IOL-related complications of cataract surgery, uh, we have uh, situations where the capsular zonular anatomy is compromised or the capsular bag is compromised. And there are various intraocular lens options that can be considered in this kind of scenario. I'm going to talk to you about how to use the capsular bag to stabilize a PC lens in using the bag. And this I'll be achieving through a couple of uh, video clippings. Uh, since uh, we have a limited time available for it, and I wanted to show more a, a, a variety of situations, diverse situations, so I'll have to fast forward through some of the movies instead of playing them fully. Uh, just I'll uh, fast forward and show them par partially. I have nothing financial here. Now, friends, uh, this is a posterior polar cataract. This patient was 73 years old. I'm not going to talk to you about how to manage a posterior polar cataract. This is a topic which is very close to me. However, uh, what I'm going to show you here in this particular case, in spite of my best efforts, you will realize that when the last chunk of nucleus was removed, there was a large posterior capsular rent. So before I removed my FACO handpiece, the OVD viscoat is injected into the anterior chamber. Uh, bimanual irrigation aspiration is the best to remove the retained cortex in this kind of scenario. And in spite of me but, uh, following all the precautions, and you know, I still could not maintain the integrity of the anterior vitreous face. So it got ruptured and uh, vitreous prolapsed into the anterior chamber. So whenever you have a PC dent with or without vitreous disturbance, you have to maintain the anterior chamber. So I injected OVD again before removing my irrigation handpiece. You need to see where the vitreous is because we have to make sure that no further damage is done to the capsular bag have as strong and as much support as possible. So do a vitrectomy in a very scientific manner by staining it with triamcinolone acetonide, 4%, which is diluted 1 is to 10. And these days I even diluted it 1 is to 20. So uh, the huge posterior capsular rent and the lens matter vitrectomy, anterior vitrectomy was performed. The residual cortex was again removed using the bimanual technique as well as using uh, dry cortex aspiration. So at the end of uh, the lens removal uh, step, uh, the dry cortex aspiration was performed. I, before, you, before you insert the intraocular lens, you have to make sure that there is no vitreous strand. Because this is one situation where uh, the vitreous strand, if present, can get ensnared with the, with the haptics of the lens, and there could be problems. So now you have a clean uh, capsular bag. So I have injected viscote, a dispersive OVD, to compress the peripheral capsular bag. So this is a three-piece hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lens, sensor lens. So make sure that the leading haptic goes into the sulcus. And this is the best way of placing the trailing haptic in the ciliary sulcus. Otherwise, if you try to rotate the trailing haptic in, it is quite possible that you know, it may go into the back, and this is what you do not want to happen. Now, if the haptics are resting only the ciliary sulcus, we know there could be a decentration, and the lens is still mobile. So here, what I'm achieving is the optic capture. The optic is buttonholed through the anterior axis and it is located in the posterior chamber, in, into, into, the, into the capsular bag. And whenever there is a PC dent and with or without vitrectomy, we always make sure that the incisions are closed with a uh, tenonal and suture. Otherwise, you'll have to lo do a lot of stromal hydration and it doesn't really, you know, look, it looks a little messy. So I would recommend that you use a stromal hydration. So this is a situation where we had a large posterior capsular end, anterior capsule was intact, and we fixated the lens in the sulcus with optic capture within the capsular bag. This is a post-operative picture, and this patient has been followed up for a long period of time. And you know, Lyle is beautifully centered, patient has absolutely normal vision, and you can see the huge spindle-shaped posterior capsular defect. So there is no way I could convert the PC defect into a posterior capsular axis. Now this is another interesting case. I had uh, referred to this case in one of my presentations uh, in some other hall. So this is a straightforward case where uh, no complication was expected. It was a bank manager, 
she wanted a multifocal intraocular lens. And I removed the lens matter, I removed the cortical material, everything is fine. So in this pa patient, I, was, I had decided to use a uh, three-piece multifocal intraocular lens, thickness acrylic multifocal. So the leading haptic has gone into the bag, nothing much great about it. The trailing haptic is placed inside and then it is going to be dialed into the capsular bag. Now just watch carefully. The lens stays decentered towards the nasal side. However much I try to recenter it, the lens don't come back. Now this is a lady in her 50s. Uh, she is very active, wanted a multifocal lens, and you have a situation where the multifocal lens is decentered. Obviously there is a large peripheral posterior capsular rent or a zonular dialysis. And I moment I realized that I in, went in with a lot of viscose behind the IL optic so that the antivitreous face was pushed behind. My first concern was the lens should not be dislocated in the posterior segment. So I su um, succeeded in bringing the lens, uh, in the entire lens into the anterior chamber. And several times viscose was injected behind the optic, make sure that the posterior capsular rent is well plugged with a layer of viscose, a dispersive OVD. And this is how, you know, the, the, the entire lens was prolapsed into the anterior chamber. So now there is uh, some breathing space for me. I examine the capsular zonular pathoanatomy. The large PC rent, rexis is intact. So here I use a different technique of keeping the haptic in the sulcus. So just a compression technique. You can use a Sinsky hook or you can use a similar instrument. Make sure that uh, you fold the lens, that you engage the haptic convexity where it is visible, then pass it around the haptic till you come to the area of maximum convexity. If you don't follow that, if you do it in a blind manner and there is arcus analysis, and sometimes you really, even if there's no arcus analysis, you don't see it, you may end up damaging the angle, peripheral angle, um, and the peripheral uh, cornea or the angle. So here the lens is uh, both the haptics and the sulcus. I have pushed the optic into the capsular bag. So again, a button holding, the lens is locked in place. And at the end of the surgery, you see the light reflex is centered exactly on the central ring. Uh, OVD was as completely removed. Of course, there's some OVD behind the optic, and which is, I didn't want to go behind. You know, ideally we have to remove the OVD as much as possible, but viscoat is relatively friendly. And when you, even if you're leaving s some amount behind, uh, it, uh, it does not raise the intraocular pressure. Ocular hypertension is not, not that much of a problem compared to the other OVDs. And you see, I closed the case with a lot of, uh, with very well-centered intraocular lens. So a patient really did not know what the fuss was all about. I saw her very frequently. On the first post-operative day, she had a vision, uncorrected vision of 66 and N6. She was perfectly happy. And this, but see the, the, um, the, the size of the PC dent, huge PC dent, starting from here to the nasal side. And this patient had done, had done extremely well, and I had made use of the capsular bag to fix it the intraocular lens. So basically, uh, there's another, can I, do I have time for another case? Yeah, so this was, uh, this was an uveitic cataract, and uh, cataract surgery was accomplished uh, very successfully. Here the take home message will be, it is not over till it is over. Now I'm going to implant an intraocular lens. I, for some reason I had decided that this patient would require a non-aspheric lens. Uh, so uh, I dis maybe because of the corneal aberration, I don't remember often now. So the last step is intraocular lens implantation. So the bag has been prepared and the leading haptic, you know, if you see carefully at one point, and if you see this carefully, you know, it becomes vertical, you know, the leading haptic becomes vertical. And uh, it goes into the bag and then I push the lens, uh, inject the lens in, and uh, the trailing haptic also uh, tends to go in, I mean, is dialed inside the, into the capsular bag, and the lens is uh, showing massive decentration. So I think what would have happened in this particular case was, uh, when the leading haptic came out, you know, it uh, penetrated or punctured the posterior capsule, and as I rotated my, rotated my injector to push the lens into the capsular bag further, the PC lens enlarged and it became huge. And when I implant, when I place the trailing haptic in the sulcus, it, 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 I try to place it in the capsular bag. When I place it in the capsular bag, you know, there was a huge uh, uh, nasal PC dent and significant decentration of the intraocular lens. So this particular case, again, I realized that first thing first, the lens should not go down. Then it becomes you know, a posterior segment surgery. You require another surgeon. 
So here I had to bring the lens into the anterior chamber. And I knew my rexis was fairly small, about four, four and a half meters, millimeters in diameter. So what you'll see here, I brought the lens back into the sulcus, into the anterior chamber, pushed it in the sulcus. And so it was basically lens lying in the bag, getting decentered. So I br brought the whole lens from the bag into the anterior chamber, kept the haptics in the sulcus, and optic capture was achieved. And subsequently, pilocarpine was injected uh, to construct the pupil. So this patient had vision had improved to 6-9 in the post-operative period, and patient had been doing extremely well. You see the huge, you know, PC dent that is, uh, this is uh, the temporal side. So in this area, there is no posterior capsule. So uh, the lessons that we have learned uh, from uh, the series of these cases here is uh, before you insert an intraocular lens, implant a lens, particularly a three-piece design, inflate the capsular back. Make sure that the posterior capsule is concave. It should not be flat or it should not be bulging at under no circumstances. So the leading haptic tip, it should never point to the posterior capsule. So as it emerges from the injector, you must rotate your hand so the leading haptic at all stages of IOL implantation is, face, is, is directed towards the left side. Never panic. So in spite of all the precautions, sometimes things happen, no, you know, it's, it, I think it is written in the fate, regardless of whatever you know, precautions we take, sometimes we get complications, so never panic. You are not going to help anybody by becoming nervous and jittery. So just keep your cool, train yourself to, uh, to have no knee-jerk reaction Use a dispersive OVD. Whenever you have a capsular zonular problem, dispersive OVD. Don't, I'm not talking about HPMs. It is also a low molecular weight dispersive OVD. I'm talking about a high molecular weight dispersive OVD, viscoat. That really saves the day for you. In all these cases, I had a large PC dent, uh, the last two cases, and both the cases, there's no uh, disturbance of the vitreous phase. And once you have, some moment you have a little suspicion of presence of vitreous in the anterior chamber, you look for it, you know, you stain it with triamcinone acetonide and manage it appropriately. Thank you so much for, uh, just before I just conclude, this is never implant these lenses in the ciliary sulcus. These are meant for the bag. The lens that goes into the sulcus has all these features and the lens which comes, Indian lens which comes closest to these criteria is the sensor hydrophobic acrylic lens. This doesn't have a square edge, this has got an optic edge design. So when you implant a lens in the, in the sulcus, like a, you have calculated for the back, but you have to keep it in the sulcus, you cannot use the same power. So this is the conversion f formula that I use, uh, which is stuck in my operation theater wall. And this is available from the Dr. Warren Hill's website. Otherwise, if you don't have, you just remember a small rule of thumb. You reduce the IOL power by a factor of 5%. Whatever be the back power, you reduce 5% and implant that lens in the sulcus. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Arup, for that wonderful presentation. Are there any questions for Arup? Yeah, yes, sir. Can you use the mic, sir? Because all the sessions are being recorded, they'll be uh, uploaded in the AS website, and that is the reason I want you to speak on the mic, sir. Absolutely, sir. Say for optic capture, you require a rexis which is about four and a half to five and a half millimeters in size, preferably five millimeter. So, if if a lens stays in the sulcus, a sense even whatever be the lens, you know, so a thirteen millimeter optic, there is always a chance for you know, for uh, intraoperative decentration or postoperative decentration, and that can be prevented by buttonholing the lens. Uh, through the rexis, so the optic is more or less in the bag. So in that situation, you don't really have to alter the intraocular lens power. Thank you. Is it necessary to remove all the TA crystals when you're doing um, an anterior vitrectomy, or is it okay to leave behind uh, it? A, it's a great question. Actually, triamcinolone acetonide is a steroid, and it has the potential of raising the intraocular pressure in the postoperative period. So as far as possible, we should try to remove it uh, uh, as completely as possible. But sometimes, you know, if you do too much, the previous work that has been, good work that has been done comes undone. So uh, sometimes, you know, we, uh, if some amount of prime solar acetonate has gone into the vitreous cavity, we will just leave it alone. We have followed up these patients postoperatively for more than a year, each every patient, uh, initially more frequently, looking for pressure elevation. A theoretical risk exists, but it has never happened. Whenever you have used triamcinolone acetonide, 
you know, the eye post-operative with the eye stays pretty quiet, you know, so post -op that because that is the anti-inflammatory effect which, uh, which really helps in the uh, patients in the post-op period. Yeah. When you say you can use a high molecule weight hmm. all that goes into the vitreous cavity, what happens to that and use so much of it to stabilize? Yeah. No, that's what I mentioned. See, as far as possible, the OVDs have to be removed. But in certain situations where uh, OVD removal uh, cannot, if you attempt complete OVD removal, uh, you have to do a lot of manipulations. For example, your PC dent where you have not done a posterior axis, that may enlarge. Further vitreous may tend to prolapse out when you try to remove the OVD. So I would use, uh, I would use a vitrector to remove the OVD, making sure that if any vitreous comes, then I would, I would uh, uh, use my vitrector to remove the vitreous. Now, sometimes, you know, residual OVD happens in this kind of complex scenario. All right. So, in such scenario, it is, it has been shown that viscoat related pressure, OVD related pressure elevation is lowest with viscoat when you compare it with HPMC or Helon 5 or Helon GV. Viscoat is the safest. I'm not telling pressure elevation will not occur, it is going to occur, but it is to, uh, to a much, much lesser magnitude. Post-operatively, uh, patients have to be followed up for a couple of days, and pressure elevation usually doesn't last for uh, more than two or three days if it, it occurs. So routinely, we'd be using you know, type IOPAR uh, for these patients for first one or two days. With Viscoat, I have not come across any tasks. See, uh, it is, again, it's a very good question because whenever you leave behind Viscoat, any OVD, the classical thing is you have to remove the last, bit, last molecule of OVD. That doesn't really work out. You know, but then you have to make sure that you use the OVDs from standard companies, companies with a good track record. I, I have been using Viscoat maybe for 20 years. See, my, my armamentarium contains uh, Viscoat. It contains Helon 5 and an Indian um, version of Helon. 1.4%. 1, 1. So this is what I have been using for uh, since the time I have started doing surgery, maybe pri private practice, about the last 16 to 18, 17 years. So they have given me wonderful results, but it's a very valid question. Anything that is used intraocularly, if you leave it behind, there's always a possibility of TAS. Yes. While Sai gets ready with this presentation, we can take up just one more question. Is there any thumb rule to place the haptic uh, when there is a PC in the direction of the uh, haptics uh, in, uh, when compared like uh, in axis of uh, range or something? Yeah. Like now, supposing if you if you are planning to keep the lens uh, in the capsular bag, uh, in that case we always uh, the long axis is oriented perpendicular to the location of the PC dent. All right. So that is some that is always done. But when I'm keeping it in the sulcus, when I'm capturing it, that's not uh, that much of an issue. Huh. And that, in that situation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what happens? Now I require uh, an intact rexis. I said preferably you know, 4.5 to 5 millimeter rexis for optic capture. Why? Even 5.5 .5 also you can capture. Uh, Post-operatively capsular contracture happens. In certain situations which I have shown here, it is more common. For example, UAT cataracts. Now if you have a rexis tear, and when capsular contracture takes place, theoretically there is a possibility that the lens will be Decentered in one direction. Okay, so that is the reason in these cases I used a non aspheric lens. Uh, I have about six or seven cases in my you know, ex experience where, th where the rexis was incomplete and I have used the same technique of capturing, though the rexis size was less than you know, 5.5 millimeter. There has not been any clin clinically significant decentration. Then I have done the you know, eye trace, cyberometry. Then I'm not, I have not find out, I have not had any situation where the, the aberrations were uh, on, the, on a, on a sig sig clinically significant uh, range. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. We'll